Yes. And this is a significant change. When did that happen? <laughs> Just now? It was probably with the new Lighthouse update. It must have been. Today we're talking about Lighthouse 10. Yay. A page speed topic again. So what is Lighthouse? Lighthouse is uh, basically the engine that powers uh, page speed tests uh, for Google. So it's like a standalone tool that you can like run locally or on a server that you can use uh, in CI to do like a page speed analysis. And this is also used by um, the pay. What is it? Uh, Web.pagespeed.dev? No. Or pagespeed.web.dev, I think, uh, is the URL yeah. um, where you can do like the official uh, Google um, page speed tests uh, that combine the core web vitals and the lighthouse scores right so and recently well actually um lighthouse 10 was already released a while ago so uh, in the beginning of february and uh, just um on march 14th uh, lighthouse was actually uh, lighthouse the lighthouse version that is used on uh, pagespeed.web.dev was updated to 10 as well so what changes right that's what we're going to look at um, so these updates are typically interesting when the uh, measurements for the page speed score changed and that's what happened again and um, there are some typically some smaller updates but this one i feel is a bigger update because one of the most significant things that changed is that they removed the time to interactive metric in lighthouse 10 and they weighted the cls the cumulative layout shift much higher like it will now account for 25 percent of the overall performance score, which is a big change, I think. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And um, also what they said, I think one of the very interesting things is that they expect that many websites will get a better page speed score with the new metrics automatically. They say in an analysis of 13 million page loads in the latest HTTP archive run, 90% of those pages would see an improvement in their Lighthouse performance score, with 50% of them seeing a performance improvement of more than five points. So if your website is getting a better page speed score after f uh, March 14th, it maybe doesn't have to do with you <laughs> or your website, but with the way how the metrics are calculated hmm. and why like i was actually a bit surprised when i when i read that that they say that a lot of pages are actually getting a higher score um because cls uh like what what websites do have issues with uh, cls or what is cls Stefan, do you want to give an explanation yeah cls uh, it is one of my favorite metrics, actually, also of the PageSpeed Insights. I was totally excited when they introduced that because what that measures is like how much elements uh, on, on a page change and shift, like from the initial rendering to when the page is fully rendered. So let's say one very easy example, you have uh, an image on a website and, and it doesn't have a height and width and aspect ratio defined, then when the page starts rendering, there is no image, right? And then if you have text before and after it, it would be collapsed. But once the image loads, the whole layout shifts. And this is what con what's considered a layout shift. And what can be very confusing or like yeah not have not not provide a great user experience because you know things move around and i always like to optimize for layouts that are just like very stable and and where things don't shift but yeah. many times there are websites that shift a lot and there are multiple reasons for that that might be well what might that be yeah so i i just want to add that uh I think like the CLS measures one of the most annoying things, right? 
Mm -hmm. Because how often, like, uh, I, I always have in my mind when I'm reading, like, a newspaper, uh, a magazine article or whatever on uh, on my cell phone, and I, uh, like, navigate to this page, and then I want to click a button or uh, click something, and then suddenly the page jumps, because maybe usually in, in these kind of uh, websites, it's, like, um, ads uh, mm -hmm. that are lazy lo or that are loaded uh, asynchronously. So um, that means, um, uh, and, but not lazy. So they will actually also load when they're not in the viewport. So whenever you are in like somewhere on the page already and above is like a, a synchronously loaded ad, then it will like just drop in the ad, the uh, um, content will jump and you might end up clicking on a different, uh, on a different button. Yeah. Right. Or even on this ad that wasn't there before. <laughs> So this is like right. one of the most annoying things. Actually, uh, uh, yesterday I noticed this again, even in WordPress in the WP admin, where when you have a Gutenberg uh, uh, page, um, the um, delete button actually lo is loaded later, right? Because it probably just first checks your um, uh, permissions uh, or whatever. So mm -hmm. I always wanted to change like uh, some... Uh, a meta value inside of the editor and i ended up clicking this move to trash button all the time and i was like this was really um like uh, annoying me mm. so yeah i think a lot of the times this layout shift is um caused by content that is asynchronously loaded right so uh, as you said, maybe an image that is obviously not there immediately when you when you load the page, and you forgot to set the aspect ratio, then some other content that is uh, inserted uh, into the DOM, um, and things like that. Uh, yeah, so, um, but it can, mm. th there are also other things, right? And, and also like something interesting. So now, actually, because of this, because usually it's when you load stuff asynchronously, I would imagine that most like client rendered website, um, websites like uh, SPA, single page applications, all of the um, uh, heavy JavaScript uh, um, uh, pages that are not server side rendered, uh, that those actually will not improve uh, in their score, right? Mm. Um, but actually they will. Um, decrease quite a bit uh, because mm -hmm. I think the previous uh, weight of the CLS was uh, 15, right? And it got 10% uh, from the TTI, the time to interactive. So now they are 25. So um, if you had a bad CLS before, your page speed score will actually go down uh, mm. uh, even further. Yeah, and um, I think, but probably because most internet websites are still server-side rendered and not using some fancy new modern technology but uh, like 40 percent are wordpress for example uh, and um, i don't know what what the other percentages are but yeah um, there you will most likely uh, have an increase in page speed performance because um, while your page might take longer to load so you have a bad tti once it's loaded, there's no layout shifts because the content is all rendered on the server, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, I think it can still go together, kind of, that you can have a bad TTI and still a high CLS because one of those things that we just experienced also with um, uh, an issue with the CLS is and a very common one is when you're using fonts like custom fonts not just like browser system defaults or website fonts but using a google font or, or any other custom font and you load it and then the issue that you could have is that that a new font renders differently but the browser first displays the fallback font or placeholder for that fallback font depending on what kind of font uh, rendering a strategy you're following but then there would be also or could be a layout jump because maybe uh there are is like one word less that fits into a line and then the whole layout shifts because yeah the the whole layout changes into or the the, the text changes into multiple lines right yeah. and that could basically happen on any website and i think this is something that every website 
has to pay attention to mm -hmm. on how you use fonts, what type of fonts you use, and that you use a very good fallback font, like one is that that is matching the probably mostly like the length of the of the font uh, of the mm. text most accurately not so much the appearance of course from design point of view the appearance is most interesting but from a rendering point of view it's more important that it matches kind of the length mm. of the text it's actually really interesting if you think about it right so um i mean this issue has been there forever right so uh, actually nothing about cls changed just uh the weight so the definition didn't change or anything so mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the to the font this was always a problem um, or is always a problem in many websites because because of like other metrics um it is actually advised that you use a font display swap right mm -hmm. so that means that you display a fallback font first and then um only once the uh the um, actual font is uh, loaded that you then switch the fonts and this is uh, exactly what you described and especially on mobile um, this can lead to content jumps right mm -hmm. um, because of words breaking where they didn't br don't break in the um, in the other font or, or the other way around mm -hmm. and um, now maybe that there is uh, more weight on cls maybe the optimal strategy is actually not anymore to use a uh, display uh, font display swap but um another one right that doesn't display the fallback font first just out of the box so if you mm -hmm. don't optimize i mean with optimizing of course uh, that's still the best thing you can do mm -hmm. also um one thing that is actually advised most of the time Uh, that you preload fonts um we have actually discovered that this is for our pages at least m most of the time not the most optimal uh, overall solution right mm -hmm. because um probably because javascript execution will get delayed a bit if you prioritize the font loading and sometimes like it depends on what's faster in in your case right the javascript execution or the font rendering and, and what will um, cause the overall um, experience to be slowed down or sped up. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, but we're talking then about these phenomenons, uh, Faut and Falk, right? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you even pronounce it like that? Flash of unstyled yeah. content, F-O-U-C and flash of unstyled Uh, text um, which is this yeah this thing where where things change due to the fonts coming in later uh, you just said that maybe we then don't use swap in the future but something else you mean like something like a uh, font display block right because there mm. like there's no typography typically displayed no mm no no font but it only ha acts as a placeholder however that placeholder yeah, exactly. how does it determine its size exactly i, I was uh, just uh, based on the uh, when you said yeah. that i was yeah. thinking the same thing yeah because um you don't know the height either of text right uh yeah if, if you don't display anything so um yeah maybe there should be or will be at some point a very clever technological way that fonts would have metadata that communicates or you can communicate somehow the rendering of the font but this probably is very complicated and still well, you need to load something first right well i have a um why like there should be a um system font that is a variable font mm -hmm. right that would and, be awesome ooh. and then you can configure that Yeah. yeah, in terms of rendering, like how, how wide, how long it renders as a mm. system font. And then maybe every new font or, that you want to use, it gives you maybe some parameters already, how you need to configure yeah. your That would be awesome. Font. So Google Fonts, start a... Do that. <laughs> start something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you get a new... Like, I don't even know what, what is the process of getting a system, a, a, a font into um operating system uh, yeah. a couple well, years ago i said call steve jobs and ask him to add another font <laughs> and and bill gates and so on but yeah <laughs> i don't know 
Yeah, this is system fonts. They, they like the, the website fonts, did they ever evolve beyond the point that this was considered website fonts? I, I don't really f feel like, right? Because... What do you mean exactly? Like, did, did any computers, like standard computers these days, was there, were there ever new font types added um, that are considered to be new website fonts, kind of, like Helvetica and, and Verdana, um, Arial, and so on. I think these have been around forever, like since mm -hmm. kind of computer existed, and we only consider them to be website because they've been always there, kind of. Mm -hmm. But there were no new type, general new types of fonts added or not uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, so that's all about fonts. There are other things, though, um, that could happen that influence this CLS. The um, images loading, and I think th there are also some some other rendering things and, and issues, and where you like maybe also when when you have JavaScript uh, menu manipulating something like changing CSS value or inserting new things to a page and so on. Yeah. Loading they... CSS. Loading CSS and loading new CSS, yeah. Because like what we do, we load CSS render blocking, right? Most of our CSS. But you mm -hmm. like this is actually not optimal either. Um but uh from our experience it's um the the in and, and this now actually will become even more important, right? Because um if you load your CSS non render blocking, you will have content on the website already and you will definitely have a cls so again mm -hmm. most of the modern javascript uh, um, uh, frameworks that try to load um, css asynchronously as well um, might run uh, into issues there with an increased um, or with worse page speed performance because they have a higher mm -hmm. cls but of course, you can do a critical path CSS that you inline and then load the remaining CSS asynchronously. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, while this might not then be um, maybe relevant for um, page speed, it is still relevant for your um, visitors and the user experience on your website, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, you whenever you hit the back button. Um, you will actually jump to the location of uh, the page, the scroll position uh, where you were before. And um, in that case, if you are loading CSS lazily, that is above the position of your, uh, where you were, mm -hmm. then um, you will have issues. However, and now like we could transition to an, another change in uh, Lighthouse 10, which is actually our topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, the BF cache, because mm -hmm. there also has been a, a a change, right? So I think the change is that they have rules now uh, and and show you when you do something that will prevent a BF cache uh, from being used. Yeah. So for those who don't know what that is, like uh, the BF back and forward cache. It's basically uh, a way how um, the browser will keep sites that you've already visited in the cache and like a snapshot of the website, including the JavaScript heap. So um, that means when you uh, hit the back button or the forward button, um, you will like the page will load immediately, uh, like almost instant um, without needing to like fetch extra resources. And uh, this is like really the speeds up um, navigation through websites um, like mm -hmm. a lot. And there are a couple of things that uh, you can do um, to prevent a site from being added to this cache. Like the most uh, um, obvious one or the, like is uh, using an event listener on the unload event, for example. And then you will get uh, like notices that you are doing this and you should change it to have a more optimal handling of mm -hmm. BF cache. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I also find it kind of fascinating how these tests or doing the tests themselves like get more and more sophisticated because in order to test this, the tool needs to go to the site and then move back and forward again, right, to to see if, if it works. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if this necessarily needs to be done because like you can just attempt to put something in the BF cache. And uh, if like a certain event listener is present or if something else uh, is uh, um, going on uh, that will prevent it, then you know it, right? Okay. So you, you don't necessarily have to like trigger a, a navigation, but you the browser just attempts to put it in the in the cache, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Might be. Yeah. I thought I even read somewhere though it happened, so maybe I got that wrong. Um, sure. And w the most significant things they they talk about also is the unload event that you just mentioned. What yeah. are other things? <clears throat> what are other things? That happened with the new version. Um, one that I really liked also is paste preventing inputs. The old best practice audit allows users to paste into password fields has been expanded to now check that pasting into any non-read-only input field will work. For most sites, preventing pasting is a net negative in user experience and prevents legitimate safety and accessibility workflows. I kind of like that. I think that's... Yeah. <laughs> Also I hate websites how... where you cannot paste anything in the password field, right? Yeah, oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting they're setting these rules because this doesn't feel like this has a lot to do with um, where, where think all that this stuff was coming from, like page speed, right? But it's more and more about e technical usability and UX tests, kind of, um, mm. that are considered a best practice in your standard. And so far, I like them. At the same time, I could be like almost a bit concerned of like, where does it go? Until what point like are then best mm. practices defined? Um, or I think it's just important that they leave, of course, enough f freedom to make creative decisions, of course. But yeah, these kind of things, th this sounds to be very, very straightforward to me. I can't think of a reasonable reason to prevent, uh, to prevent this. Yeah. Yeah. And just imagine if uh, um, somehow Google doesn't like a certain technology and then they start like writing, yeah, you shouldn't be using WordPress. <laughs> uh, but they're rather supporting WordPress yes. so far, interestingly, because also the page speed uh, results like uh, sometimes shows you like, yeah, hey, your website looks to be using WordPress. Consider doing mm. this and that, um, which is kind of great. Yeah. But yeah. They could be shooting against something more specific, React, or I don't know. No, but probably not. Anyways, um, what else is there to talk about? Lighthouse 10. Um, if you don't know the calculator, check that out. Mm -hmm. What is the calculator? If you go to pagespeed.web.dev, and then there you run a PageSpeed Insights test, then there is a small button or a small link um, telling you about the calculator, which opens your current test results in a little calculator uh, with all those scores that you got, like and the, the measurements, like how many milliseconds it took for the largest content uh, full paint, yeah, and the CLS and so on. And then you can change also those metrics to see how much you need to improve your score um, to get to 100 or how much room you've got to get worse on that. And you can also change uh, between different versions of Lighthouse to see yeah, how your score evolved over time with the new measurements that were introduced by Lighthouse. And I think this is a great analytic tool and also a great tool to to understand like what what needs to be done and how things are calculated. Yeah. yeah, you actually also see exactly your percentage score for all of the different um uh, different metrics, right? Yeah. Which is uh, quite nice actually because you don't have that information in the in the overview uh, screen. Yeah. Yeah, and the way it works is that every metric gets like its own metric score. And um, then if you have a metric score of 100 on one metric, even if you improve that further, that metric, it won't get you a better overall page speed score. 
right? So, um, and to see that, like that you are at 100 already, just like uh, tells you what you need to concentrate on to make a significant impact yeah. on improving things. Mm. Does One anyone actually still look at desktop page speed scores? <laughs> I just realized again. I think, I think like, so. Yeah. I think when the mobile one is really bad, you look at the desktop. <laughs> yeah, <stuff>. Right. <laughs> this is like, oh, look, look at this. And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's desktop. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, I mean, it, there are probably cases where you don't have any mobile visitors or, or hardly any, right? If mm -hmm. you have such a site that where you know the demographics or, or the um, the technology of, of your visitors is uh, more desktop. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually want to um, uh, add one thing that changed, which actually doesn't show up in the um, in the release notes. And like maybe somebody else uh, knows about this and when and how this changed. But we noticed this uh, when looking at the uh, um, the CLS scores. Um, Actually, a new device is now used for the mobile um, uh, test of uh, Lighthouse. And it doesn't look like it's a new one because the um, the device is actually um, a an emulated Moto G. And now comes the difference, power. Yes. Right? So, and what is really interesting, the uh, screen resolution of uh, that device is different from the normal Moto G. So that means if you always optimized um, for these, what was was it, 320 or 360? Mm -hmm. uh, um, if you always optimized for that to get like the best page speed result, which of course you shouldn't do, but just uh, thinking if you did that, um, I think the new um, uh, uh, size width of, of the device is some something like uh, 415 uh, pixels. So uh, yeah, keep uh, that in mind, right? You know what? I just what? I just found out something. This the moment you're talking, I'm just looking at it. It does have like you can hover over the device and it will tell you the resolution. Just like I think yesterday, yeah. we were like googling what is this yeah. Moto G power <laughs> yes. device? Where do we get yes. the screen size from? And so why don't they tell us? And okay. maybe you've just like been impatient or they just added it. You just got to hover over the device and that will say it has a resolution of 412 times 823 with a device pixel ratio of 1.75. Yeah. Yes. And this is so important. It was always the, what, what yeah. the Moto G4? Yes. And this is significant change. Yeah. When did that happen? <laughs> just now? It was probably with the new Lighthouse update. It must have been, uh, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, but it's it's really interesting that this is not communicated that much. Maybe they think, okay, there's not a big difference between a Moto G and a Moto G Power. It's probably just like, uh, I don't know, um, internals. But it's actually, yeah, the, the screen resolution is different. And this is like super important. Absolutely, because that, well, that just happened to us also that we tested it and we tested it like on mobile and 320 pixel width, I guess, or something like that. And there we didn't have CLS, like the font mm -hmm. running didn't change. And we're like, what, how, how do they, how do they come up with this? Why, why do mm -hmm. they say it changes? And the only reason is because the text was breaking differently at 412 pixels. And I just, I just found also in this moment, I went to the GitHub page of Google Chrome Lighthouse and there in the release tags, there they are saying only in the long list of detailed change log, uh, breaking change core retire Moto G4 use Moto G power. Yeah, but only like one of a hundred yeah. list items like the single commit this is so important to know about yeah should tweet that <laughs> yes and um, it's also interesting because when you are developing layouts for mobile for a long time it was the standard was 320 then it was like at some point i think considered to be 375 then it was like 420 and and like nowadays I don't feel there is a mobile resolution anymore, right? To optimize specifically for 
even within like iPhones, like with a new iPhone lineup, there are multiple screen sizes on uh, the pro version versus the regular or SE and so on. And um, uh, now we have the Moto G Power with 412 pixels width. Like who came up with this? This is a little weird, 412. And of course, like ideally you are developing for mobile resolutions within a range, but still like you, you usually you check your design when you develop something new at a specific size, right? Because you want to consistently consider a specific size. And if you are looking at optimizing for page speed score in UX, you should be looking at 412 right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it was always like, okay, we know nobody's, or not a lot of people are using 320 anymore, so we don't need to necessarily optimize for that. But it was always because of uh, page speed uh, that we needed to um, take special care of that as well, right? Yeah. And why am I saying that? Like, even if you shouldn't optimize, right? Like, you shouldn't optimize too hard for for this, but rather for your um, like th that all resolutions are, are fine, but especially with images, right? So if um, if you uh, um, of course you have responsive images, but you in a in a fluid setting, you cannot have a responsive image for every width, right? So you need to make a decision. And before, when you said, okay, most of our users have a screen resolution of 420, but now we need to add like another 320 width image uh, just so that we don't get like uh, the, the down uh, rating for like um, uh, serving unoptimal images or, or something uh, like that, right? Or mm -hmm. what is it? Image resolutions. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, but also like when the new standard was the moto g4 i think had that had probably a device pixel ratio of one i'm just assuming and what stands out to me now is that the new device has a device pixel ratio of 1.75 mm. so with if my math is correct with 412 pixels then times 1.75 that would be uh, like physical pixels kind of of 721 width mm. so that would that mean would that if you're con like optimizing for the page speed score mm. there's no reason you need an image size smaller than 721 pixels wide yeah but we kind of always said that anyways right because the the width the the, the, the narrow uh, sizes are mobile and mobile has usually a higher uh, like has a, usually a retina screen exactly these days, yeah. right but yeah look yeah, we just i think in flint we also deprecated like uh smaller sizes and so on in mm. the new version but yeah it's interesting this is this is changing uh now and to be aware of that cool i like it mm. yeah so i think that sums up the changes they are probably like there is the change log of the as you said of the lighthouse uh, uh, 10 release that covers of course a, a lot more than we were able but we just uh, uh, summarized the blog post about uh, the the release yes and what's new yeah so go ahead and, and read that if you're interested other otherwise make sure to keep that in mind what what has changed and uh, how to deal with that yeah.